and I see your Schwartz is as big as mine. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the best and funniest spoof scenes in movies, no matter how big or small the reference is. You're, you're behind the couch. <laughs> what? How do you know that? I can um, see your feet. Number 20, the Snozberries from Willy Wonka. Super Troopers. Vermont State Troopers pull over a car where the occupants are using narcotics. They tried to ditch the drugs by ingesting a ton and throwing some out the window, but it didn't work. Are you okay? Yeah, sure. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. Now, did you say yes, sir? I think he said yeah, sure. The Troopers, Thorny and Rabbit, enjoy messing with the guys before they place them in the back of the patrol car. A bit later, after a high-speed chase, one of the guys is seen licking the divider window of the car and says that the snozberries taste like snozberries. In Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, one of the products produced by Wonka is lickable wallpaper, where if you like certain fruits, it'll taste like said fruits, and included is the snozberry. Try some more. The strawberries taste like strawberries. The snozberries taste like snozberries. Number 19, T-1000 from Terminator 2 Judgment Day, Wayne's World. Wayne's World is filled with tons of classic bits, but perhaps one of the most surprising is the appearance of the T-1000. Hey, do you know this guy? Nah, I don't know. When Wayne races over to where Cassandra is shooting a music video, he's pulled over by a police officer on a motorcycle. There's a slow buildup as the cop walks up to the Garth Mobile, takes off his helmet, and holds up a picture asking Wayne if he's seen the boy. Yes, officer, is there something wrong? Have you seen this boy? Of course, it's Robert Patrick reprising his role from Terminator 2 Judgment Day. Understandably, Wayne takes off screaming. We would too. Number 18, the notepad from North by Northwest, the Big Lebowski. The dude gets caught up in an elaborate extortion plot when he's mistaken as Jeffrey Lebowski, given that he and the other Lebowski share the same name. This brings the dude into contact with Jackie Treehorn, a big time producer of erotica. How's the smut business, Jackie? I wouldn't know, dude. I deal in publishing, entertainment, political advocacy. Uh, which one's log jamming? Yes, regrettably it's true. Standards have fallen in adult entertainment. He meets Treehorn at his home, where they're trying to work out a solution to their problem. Suddenly, Treehorn gets a call and writes something down on a notepad. He momentarily leaves the room, and the dude cleverly shades the notepad Treehorn used, only to find he drew a dirty sketch. Excuse me. This is a spoof on North by Northwest, where the same technique is used, but it yields useful information. Number 17, Dawn of Man from 2001 A Space Odyssey, Zoolander. The fashion industry has been behind many political assassinations over the years, and the Malaysian Prime Minister is the next target. Almost five. What? Hey guys, that show is in three hours. Derek is dead unless we get that evidence. Derek Zoolander and Hansel McDonald break into the office of Zoolander's agent to recover incriminating computer files. However, the duo aren't exactly the brightest and don't actually know how to operate or even turn on the computer. Puzzled, they resort to slapping and hitting the machine while making ape vocalizations. This is very similar to how the apes in 2001 A Space Odyssey react once the monolith appears. Hansel is even about to use a bone to strike the computer, but he's stopped by Derek. Number 16, Kevin Costner from Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, Robin Hood, Men in Tights. After being captured during the Crusades, Robin of Loxley returns to England to find that his home has been repossessed and that King John, along with the Sheriff of Rottingham, have been unfairly treating the citizens of the land. I shall tell all that I see that there is one man in England who is not afraid to stand up to Rottingham and his men. Good. Tell them that. And tell them also that I vow to put an end to the injustice. Robin decides to confront the king at a lavish banquet. He openly accuses John of being an usurper and demands that he stops levying new taxes or he will lead the people of England in a rebellion. When John asks why people should listen to him, Robin replies that he can actually speak with an English accent. And why should the people listen to you? Because, unlike some other Robin Hoods, I can speak with an English accent. This is a direct reference to Kevin Costner's performance in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, where he doesn't exactly sound like an English native. Number 15, the post credit scene from Ferris Bueller, Deadpool. Deadpool is known for breaking the fourth wall and addressing the audience, so it should be no surprise that he pays tribute to Ferris Bueller, another character who frequently looks into the camera. A, you can never go too far. B, if I'm gonna get busted, it is not gonna be by a guy like that. Of course, post credit scenes are fairly common, 
especially for superhero movies. And at the end of Deadpool, we're treated to Mr. Pool in a bathrobe, telling us to go home because there's not going to be a teaser for Deadpool 2. Oh, you're expecting a teaser for Deadpool 2. Well, we don't have that kind of money. This takes a page from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, where post-credits, Ferris berates the audience for sticking around after the film is over. It's a nice touch. Number 14. You Like Apples from Goodwill Hunting, Jay and Silent Bob Strike Back. In order to stop a movie being made about their comic book alter egos, Jay and Silent Bob travel to Hollywood. Come on, Silent Bob. We're going to Hollywood. When they finally arrive in Tinseltown, they sneak into Miramax's studio lot, and we get to take a look at some of the other projects going on. Jay and Silent Bob find themselves on the set of Goodwill Hunting 2, Hunting Season. They revisit the bar scene from Goodwill Hunting, where Will faces off against Clark. Everything about this scene is over the top, from director Gus Van Sant counting money in the corner, to Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's performance as fictionalized versions of themselves. I don't like the sound of them apples, Will. What are we gonna do? Jackie? Yeah? It's hunting season. Applesauce, bitch. Number 13, Warehouse Dance from Footloose, Hot Rod. Looking to make a name for himself and earn the respect of his stepfather, Frank, Rod Kimball returns home one day to find out that Frank needs a heart transplant or he'll die. All I want is to earn your respect, Frank. How can I do that if you won't fight me? Well, maybe you should have thought of that before you sucked at being a man all your life. Oh my god, I hate you so much. I just want to smash your face in. Looking to vent his frustrations, Rod goes to his quiet place, which is in the middle of the forest. Here, he dances out his pent-up anger in a similar fashion to Kevin Bacon's Ren McCormick in Footloose. Rod's dancing may not be as smooth as Ren's, but the whole scenario is quite humorous, especially when it abruptly ends rolling down a hill for what seems like an eternity. Number 12, Feeling Lucky from Dirty Harry, The Mask. Stanley Ipkiss's life changes when he comes across a mysterious mask. He goes from a down-on-his-luck pushover to a wild, charismatic, and confident individual. Spoken! <laughs> it's party time! P-A-R-T. Why? Because I gotta! Towards the end of the movie, in order to rescue the girl and save the day, as the mask, he confronts Dorian Tyrell's henchmen. He pulls out a huge arsenal of weaponry and asks them if they feel lucky. This is, of course, a reference to Dirty Harry, complete with Jim Carrey's spot-on impression of Clint Eastwood. Now you have to ask yourself one question. Do I feel lucky? Well... Do ya? Punks. Much like Harry Callahan, the masked weapons are empty, but that's revealed after the henchmen run away. Number 11, Makeover from She's All That. Not another teen movie. Although it parodies several teen rom-coms, perhaps one of the funniest moments from Not Another Teen Movie is when Janie Biggs receives a makeover. That's it. I've got it. What? Might seem crazy, but you're just gonna have to trust me. The moment is lifted from She's All That where Lainey Boggs is given a makeover by Zack Seiler's sister before going out to party. The previously nerdy Boggs is revealed to be drop-dead gorgeous. When Janie gets her makeover by simply having her glasses removed and her hair let down, it highlights the fact that the supposed unattractive nerdy characters are played by attractive actresses. That's it. I did it, I'm a miracle worker. The scene is capped off by Janie falling through the stairs when she reveals her new look. Number 10, Disco Dancing from Saturday Night Fever, Airplane. Sure, it may be about nothing more than a group of quirky airport employees, but Airplane is one of the greatest and most quotable satirical comedies ever. Listen, kid. I've been hearing that crap ever since I was at UCLA. I'm out there busting my buns every night. Tell your old man to drag Walton and Lanier up and down the court for 48 minutes. Even though it mostly parodies the disaster film genre overall, the best spoof in Airplane is its pretty much shot-for-shot -shot remake of a famous moment in Saturday Night Fever. In the scene, the main protagonist, Ted Stryker, is telling the story of how he met his one true love, Elaine, and it involves a bar, the Bee Gees, and a rather silly version of a disco dance number originally performed by John Travolta. From the choreography to the famous zingers, Airplane's level of comedy stays sky-high throughout, and especially in this scene. I was captivated, entranced. It hit me like a thunderbolt. I had to ask the guy next to me to pinch me to make sure I wasn't dreaming. Number 9. Staircase Shootout from The Untouchables and Battleship Potemkin. Naked Gun 33 and a Third, The Final Insult. It may be the lowest grossing Naked Gun film, but 33 and a Third still brings the spoofs. 
In fact, the film's opening is a parody of a parody. It recreates a famous scene from 1987's The Untouchables, which in turn recreated the famous Odessa Step sequence from 1925's Battleship Potemkin. Frank Trebin is waiting for, uh, something, when he decides to help a woman with a baby carriage up the many, many stairs. Much like Kevin Costner. But once the mobsters show up, Trebin starts a wild shootout that involves multiple falling strollers. President Clinton, the Pope, mass murdering mailmen, and awkwardly, O.J. Simpson, just before the infamous murder. Hey look, it's the president! And the Pope! As if that weren't funny enough, it's all a dream. Number eight, T-Rex reveal from Jurassic Park, Wayne's World 2. Whether he's crashing weddings like Dustin Hoffman in The Graduate, or pulling off the Thelma and Louise ending, Mike Myers is clearly a movie buff. Let's just keep going, Wayne. But for our money, the best spoof scene in Wayne's World 2 is his parody of Jurassic Park, which was released a mere six months before this sequel. Wayne and Garth are trying to plan a music festival called Wayne Stock, and they're scouting the location on a rainy day. But all of a sudden, they encounter a T-Rex, paying homage to an iconic shot in the Steven Spielberg film. Listen. What? How did Wayne and Garth end up in Jurassic Park, you may be asking? We're not worthy of the answer. Number seven, always been here from The Shining, Hot Fuzz. Like many movies on this list, this badass British police comedy is a satire of an entire genre's worth of films, but the scene we've selected parodies something entirely different. Check in, but you've always been here. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost are two police officers trying to solve a mystery in a quaint little village. When Pegg's character, Nicholas Angel, is checking into his hotel, he's met with a line of dialogue eerily reminiscent of The Shining. However, whereas Jack Torrance's hotel chat is with a ghost, Sergeant Angel is just trying to get to his room. Fortunately, the hotel Angel checks into isn't haunted, and the conversation is followed by a slew of hilarious misunderstandings involving a crossword puzzle. I'm Joyce Cooper. I trust you had a pleasant trip. Fascist. I beg your pardon. System of government characterized by extreme dictatorship. Seven across. Number six, head spin from The Exorcist, Toy Story. Like any animated feature worth its salt, Pixar's breakout movie about the secret life of toys threw in enough jokes for the adults to keep parents entertained alongside their kids. It's busted. Who are you calling busted, Buster? That's right. I'm talking to you, Sid Phillips. In an effort to teach a budding psychopath Sid a lesson and save his buddy Buzz, Woody enlists the help of Sid's other victims to scare the bejesus out of the toy torturer. During the ambush, our favorite cowboy doll takes a page out of the Exorcist book, spinning his head around a full 360 much like the possessed Reagan McNeil does in front of two shaken priests. It may be a little heavy for a kid's movie, but nonetheless, the reference fits perfectly. We toys can see everything. So play nice. Now let's use Sid to play nicer with toys. Number five, Chestburster from Alien, Spaceballs. Following a Han Solo-like character and his half-man, half-dog sidekick as they travel the galaxy to defeat the evil Lord Dark Helmet and save a princess, this Mel Brooks space spoof tackles Star Wars, parroting everything from Imperial cruisers to near declarations of paternity. I am your father's, brother's, nephew's, cousin's former roommate. What's that make us? Absolutely nothing! But it's got a dead-on alien spoof we just can't forget. In their travels, Captain Lone Star and Barf stop at a diner, where John Hurt also happens to be eating. What follows is a scene we swear we've seen somewhere before. Making this otherwise disgusting alien parody even funnier is the fact that the chestburster then performs a charming musical number, a la Michigan J. Frog. Hello, my baby! Hello, my honey! Hello, my ragtime gal! Say what you will, but that's adorable. Number four, fatherly reveal from The Empire Strikes Back, Austin Powers, The Spy Who Shagged Me. One of the most hilarious spoof scenes in this satire of James Bond is actually another parody of Star Wars. Austin and Dr. Evil have finally caught up with each other on the villain's moon base when the good doctor makes a stunning reveal. Know this. Austin. <sighs> I am your father. However, unlike The Empire Strikes Back, Dr. Evil is of course not Austin's father, and admits how ridiculous his claim is. Hey, at least he was honest, right? What ups the funny factor of this scene even more is how out of nowhere it is. 
No, not really. I can't back that up. Right. Idiot. Yes. And lucky for Austin Powers fans, this spoof scene is one of many. Number 3. Bulletproof Vest Trick from A Fistful of Dollars – Back to the Future Part 3 The third installment of the BTTF franchise follows Marty McFly and Doc Brown to 1885, where they can reference as many movies as they want, and no one will know what they're talking about. You talking to me? You talking to me, Tannen? Well, I'm the only one here. In fact, while in the Old West, Marty goes by the name of Clint Eastwood, and that piece of foreshadowing comes into play near the end of the film. Marty, or Clint, has agreed to face Mad Dog Tannen in a gunfight, but being from 1985, he has a century's worth of wisdom to help him out at the showdown. I thought we could settle this like men! You thought wrong, dude. Marty taps into his film knowledge, copying the real Clint Eastwood's move in A Fistful of Dollars by taking a boilerplate and using it as a makeshift bulletproof vest. Bad. Ass. Number 2. Garage Door Death from Scream. Scary Movie. If you remember the 90s, you know that teen horror flicks made a big comeback during that decade, and with them, they brought the inevitable spoofs. Hello? Who's there? <gasps> oh my god! Scary Movie takes aim at many popular horror films, but the scene we've chosen mocks an iconic death from 1996's Scream. A young partygoer is trapped in the garage by Ghostface, but where things diverge from the source material is when the girl tries to escape through the kitty flap in the garage door. This girl doesn't get her head crushed by the opening garage, no. Due to her weight, she causes everything to collapse on top of her. Seeing Ghostface's reaction to the incident makes this moment comedic gold. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Defoe Death from Platoon – Tropic Thunder Since this Ben Stiller joint is a satire of the film industry as a whole, it's littered with hysterical references to past films and actors. Who left the fridge open? But one of the most memorable spoof scenes comes at the beginning of the movie, where the actors are filming an intense and expensive action sequence for their fictional film, also called Drop of Thunder. Stiller's character, Tug Speedman, is running out of the jungle, hands to the sky, as he's shot multiple times. This moment was, of course, originally made famous by Willem Dafoe in Oliver Stone's Platoon, and Stiller and co. do it comedic justice. The scene is so overly dramatic, it's perfect and it makes us cry tears of laughter every time. What's your favorite spoof scene? Let us know in the comments. Funny, isn't it? You would never suspect that everyone at this school is a professional dancer. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.